Good afternoon. My name is Yisan Taylor with I Love the Berg, and I'd like to welcome everyone to our next installment of the History Half Hour. These free history tours are made possible in part by the city of St. Petersburg. We're about to get started with today's host, Monica Kyle, who's live on 22nd Street South, right across from the Manhattan Casino. Her husband, John Kyle, is going to be running the slideshow for us today. You'll be seeing a mix of live footage and slides with historic photos. We hope you enjoy. If you have a question during our live tour, please feel free to use the comment section. We're going to do our best to work in as many questions during the live tour as possible. Once again, thank you for, for joining us. Be sure to follow I Love the Bird on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, as well as subscribing to our newsletter to stay up to date on our next history tour, the latest news, exclusive deals, and all things good in the Bird. Monica, over to you. Thank you, Isa. Sorry, we're a little bit late. We had a technical difficulty getting started on Facebook Live. And I'm Monica Kyle. I'm joined by Andrew Harlan, who is behind the camera. Uh, in a moment, we're going to be meeting up with Terry Lipsy Scott, who is the executive director of the Woodson African American Museum. We are going to see all of the juices today because it's really just too big of an area with too many great landmarks to cover all of it in one history half hour tour. So we're going to be splitting it up. Today, we're going to be seeing the north end of 22nd Street South and the west end of 9th Avenue South. So if you think of the Deuce as kind of as a T uh, between 22nd and 9th, we're going to be seeing one half of that T. Uh, John, why don't you throw up the map so they can get a sense of where we are. I'm standing on 22nd Street, just north of 7th Avenue South, just south of Fairfield Avenue South. Uh, I'm up where the snow peak, you can see on that map, and then we're going to be heading south. We'll be taking a right on 9th Avenue and going down to the Jordan Elementary School, which will be our end point today. Go ahead and, and make me big again, if you would, please, John. This is a really rich area with a lot of great stories to tell. This is a historically African-American neighborhood known fondly as the Deuces after the double twos in 22nd Street. In its heyday, it rivaled other black main streets like Sweet Auburn in Atlanta and Beale Street in Memphis. Communities that were really kind of forced into existence by the Jim Crow laws that were at, enacted throughout the South following the Civil War. Laws that were really meant to keep blacks and whites very separate and segregated in both their residential and their business community. So had sort of the unintended consequence of creating really a captive audience, if you will, and creating these thriving black uh, business communities like we had here at 22nd Street. During its heyday, around 1960, the early 60s, there were 111 businesses lining 22nd Street, roughly between 5th Avenue South and 15th Avenue South. Three quarters of them were owned by African Americans. Much of that other quarter businesses were owned by Jewish, white Jewish merchants who also weren't really welcomed in the downtown business district. We're going to be learning a little bit about that today and how that came into being. This was originally just a kind of a dirt country trail. Um, I, I think a lot of us probably know the origin story of St. Petersburg. John, if you throw up that first picture, lots of us have heard the story of the Russian exile, Peter Demons, who brought his Orange Belt Railroad to what was then a little hamlet known as Wardsville in 1888 to property owned by John C. Williams. The terminus of the railroad was about where Tropicana Field sits today. And St. Pete is born, June 8th, 1888, when the first locomotive, Maddie, rolls into town. Lots of us have heard that story. What most people don't think about or is not often talked about, is who actually built the railroad. The, and I mean the men whose hands actually wielded the axes. And what color those hands were, and they were, of course, black. There were about 100 black laborers who worked on the final stages of the construction of the Orange Belt Railroad into what became St. Petersburg. Following its completion, about 12 of them stayed on with their families in the area. And they began to settle in what became pretty readily identifiable neighborhoods, black neighborhoods. The first along 4th Avenue South was called Peppertown. It's shortly followed by a neighborhood that is called Cooper's Quarters. It's just south of the railroad tracks, which is today's First Avenue South, and just west of 9th Street. So roughly the area where Tropicana Field is today. A neighborhood later becomes called, becomes, gets the name the gas plant after the two large natural gas cylinders that are in the area. The Peppertown and the gas plant no longer exist. The gas plant was wiped out in a, an urban renewal project that 
and later gave way to Tropicana Field a few years after the neighborhood was really demolished out of existence. There was a third neighborhood called Methodist Town north of Central Avenue. We did a tour of Methodist Town last month. You can go back on the I Love the Berg website and watch that. But then you had the really the largest and the um, most concentrated black African-American neighborhood in St. Pete was known as the Deuces. And it grows along 22nd Street South, which as I was saying, was just really a sandy dirt trail. It was actually when it first started, this was out, outside the city limits. This part of the city wasn't annexed until 1925. So the community that grows up here is really far on the outside of town. It really grows during the 1930s and 40s. There's a huge population boom. Uh, in the black community, the, the black population of St. Petersburg grows by 61% in the 1930s. Many of them come here and that's intentional on the white city leaders part. Uh, during the early 1930s, the city is making an effort. Our tourism industry is booming and there's a concentrated effort to move blacks out of the downtown core and into this neighborhood down here. There's actually a committee that's formed to find a, what they called a proposed colored district or a Negro segregation area. We have some pictures of that. And it's actually written into our city charter and passed by a city council resolution in 1936. You can see the map that was outlined in the newspaper in 1936. Now this becomes really pretty unenforceable because the black population in St. Petersburg is really just too big to fit into this small area. It's about 15 to 20%. These headphones like to jump out of my ears. It's about 15 to 20 percent of the population. John, can you still hear me? John? Yes, we can still hear okay. you. Yeah, I was muted. Sorry. <laughs> the population uh, is about 15. The black population is about 15 to 20 percent of the St. Petersburg population throughout our history. So it's not really enforceable to, to mandate that all blacks live within this 10 by 18 block designated area. But it certainly becomes custom. Blacks are not given building permits outside of this area. And so it leads to this burgeoning business district along 22nd Street South. Most of it is not remaining today. You can see this big empty lot here beside me. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. Part of the reason that this area was chosen was because of its proximity to industry. So just behind me, you can see parts of what was called soft water laundry. It's now uh, the arts exchange, part of the warehouse arts district. But soft water laundry was a huge employer for 66 years. They did all the linens for the hotels, the tablecloths for the restaurants. There was also farmer concrete works in this area, which made all the hexagon blocks for the sidewalks and Latrell lumber, which provided building supplies for our huge building. Boom. Those were all located just back here. So, the jobs that African-Americans were working on were right here. They were walking distance. Even if you didn't work in one of these places, if you worked downtown as maybe a hotel porter, you came back here to lay your head at night. St. Pete was very much a sundown town, meaning blacks were not supposed to be above Central Avenue after dark. So you could live in the Deuces neighborhood and really spend your entire life here. You would probably be born at Mercy Hospital, the all black hospital or in the home of a, a midwife, more likely. You would go to school at Jordan Elementary, which we'll see in a few minutes, or and then on to Gibbs High School, all black. If you wanted to go swimming, you went to Jenny Hall Pool, which is a, a black pool just on the other side of the interstate here. Um, you get married in one of the scores of churches, which we'll see on our next tour. Um, and when you died, you were buried by one of the black funeral homes, Creole Williams um, or Clark's Mortuary. So there was this very vibrant, community um, and cohesive feel in this area. Much of it is gone today, and we'll talk about why in just a moment. Again, this empty lot, but across from me is one of the remaining landmarks of the Deuces neighborhood. This is the Manhattan Casino, built originally as the Jordan Dance Hall in 1925. It was known for having the largest hard oak wooden dance floor in the state of Florida. The best, not the largest, the best, I should say. Uh, wooden dance floor in the state of Florida. It was really a cultural community center for 40 years for this neighborhood. And it had things like the high school prom was here, coronations, balls, dances, um, social clubs would meet here. And when it wasn't functioning as a community center, it hosted, 
it was a famous stop on the Chitlin circuit, which was kind of a renowned circuit of bars and nightclubs where black entertainers could play in the days of segregation. The music promoter who booked most of these acts was a man named George Rogan, and he had lived for a while in New York City. Uh, he probably was responsible for the name change to Manhattan Casino, kind of this aspirational, you know, the bright lights of the big city. And he, he had a lot of contacts and he in New York still, and he booked people like Count Basie and Duke Ellington, Ella Fitzgerald, Louis Armstrong, Little Richard. It's, it said that George Rogan gave, um, what's the? James the, Brown. James Brown, his start. Um, so all of these, these performers came through here. Now, they couldn't stay in the hotels downtown, so they would often stay in the homes of uh, residents in the community. Uh, Sam Cook stayed in apartment 254 in the Jordan Park housing complex. Um, I can see the Turner the same. Um, so, you know, a lot of life going through here. On the downstairs, there was a series of businesses, shops, restaurants. The post office was here. So it was really a kind of a 24 hour um, hive of activity. There's a list of, John's got a slide that shows the remain the businesses that were here in 1960. When we get a chance, we're going to cross the street. And we're going to walk out today. So it was bought by the city and designated as a historic landmark and refurbished and renovated in 2002. And there's been some sort of fits and starts with trying to bring businesses back. But it's just reopened again as the 22 South Food Hall. And you can see these restaurants that are here. we got Harper's Hamburgers, Scratch Snacks, Erie Mont, Jamaican Grill, and I think Better Way is Barbecue. And I will tell you, let's go ahead and cross, Andrew. That the smell that is wafting out of this place is very tempting. I, you wish you had smell it right now because it smells really good. We are walking down to the statue, a statue that was dedicated last year um, in 2020. The, I believe this is correct, the only statue that the city of St. Petersburg has ever paid for and built of, a, of an individual person. And it's a much deserved honor because it is a statue of a man named Elder Jordan. And he built the Jordan Dance Hall that later became the Manhattan Casino, amongst many other things that he built in this area. Elder Jordan was born around 1850, born into slavery, um, later buys his way out of slavery, comes to St. Petersburg, not totally sure when, sometime probably around the turn of the century. And as an entrepreneur, really from the very beginning, he uh, sells fruits and vegetables from his front porch. He opened a livery stable and a bus transportation between St. Pete and Tampa. He, he, he was a very distinguished, very tall man, was known for kind of wearing a cowboy hat, work pants and a vest with a very striking wife uh, who was a Cherokee Indian actually from Rosewood, Florida. And he was you know, always out and about in the community. Um, as he gathers up a little bit of money, he starts buying tax deeds and becomes a real estate developer and builds a lot of the businesses and houses along 22nd Street. There's a picture in our slideshow of some shotgun houses that he built. He often would build in the court style, uh, kind of a group of houses centered around a communal court where things like, you know, wash would be done on Sundays and um, communal meals would be done in these courts, really uh, out of the African tradition. So he built a lot of these courts. That one in the picture that John is showing was demolished, unfortunately, in 2015. So we don't know that we have any Elder Jordan buildings left in the community. But he did so well for himself that it said that he lent money to the city of St. Petersburg during the Depression and donated the land on which the Jordan Park housing complex was built in the 19. 40s. In addition to his business success, he was a real advocate for the community, constantly arguing for better education opportunities for black children, hence the elementary school, the second black elementary school built in St. Petersburg. The first was Davis Academy. There's a couple pictures in there of that. Um, the second one is built in 1925, just on the other side of the interstate. We'll see it in a minute. And it's named after Elder Jordan as well. Um, so really a, a great man, I think really deserving of this beautiful statue. I think it's made out of bronze. We're going to walk now under the interstate and around the corner of the Carter Woods to, to the Woodson Museum. And John's going to talk a little bit about why these lots here are empty. And in particular, Andrew, if you could, there's this one big empty lot John's going to talk about. And then on the other side of 7th Avenue, there's another empty lot 
and we're going to be talking later about what's going to end up in that lot. So we're going to walk down. Go ahead, John. Thanks, Vaughn. Um, yeah, I'm going to put up a couple of maps here. Um, and this shows 22nd Street kind of going under the interstate where Monica is about to walk. Um, here's the, the Manhattan Casino. She's walking under there. And I want to talk about the two forces that really were working against um, black uh, business districts in the 1960s and 70s. First was desegregation. Um, black middle class freedom to spend and live in other parts of the city was putting pressure on, on these uh, black downtowns. They're starting to suffer economically. Monica mentioned that, that it was sort of at its peak in the early 60s and really by the late 60s, they're feeling pressure. The second major pressure was this interstate highway coming through here. Uh, the expansion of the interstate highway system in many cities and particularly in St. Petersburg um, was a real detriment to, to uh, industrial areas uh, and working class and lower income black neighborhoods. So you really had a lot of pressure uh, working against the neighborhood here. And you'll see all this vacant land that kind of borders the interstate on both sides is really part of interstate construction. Um, and this is why I shouldn't step until midnight. This next map is going to help you visualize. I'm up till midnight researching what was here before, because this neighborhood really got cut off from the rest of the deuces. You had the homes of prominent uh, doctors like Fedalsa, who integrated um, Bayfront Hospital, then Mound Park Hospital. You had the childhood home of Lou Brown, or the actually the adult home of Lou Brown, who was the first realtor in the area. You had the owner of Hardin's Grocery. Prominent citizens lived in this neighborhood. Now it's cut off. And think about the upheaval that comes with the Everybody? construction of an interstate. Um, you just John, really have like talking right now. Good to see you. You're just talking right now. Um, Sorry, that was John you, have this, you have this this really incredible um, period of time where there's construction and vacant land, and it really cuts off this area where you have uh, an industrial area sandwiched between uh, on one side and the interstate on the other side, and it's really not a place that anybody wants to live. Fast forward to the late uh, 1990s, early 2000s you start, the city starts to realize, okay, we've made a mistake in, in cutting off this part of the neighborhood. What can we do? They begin buying up properties and rezoning it industrial in order to set it up for um, job opportunities for light industry. And you can see that, that how difficult that is, how hard it has been to get the Manhattan Casino going over the years. And it really, it just hasn't taken hold yet. If you look at some of those other um, businesses that kind of border the old um, rail way, which, was, which is now the Pinellas Trail, you're starting to see artists and startups and light industry coming into there. And, and so it is starting to take hold, but you can just see how difficult it is to, to bring that sort of opportunity to these areas again. And um, you know, one of the big things that was lost when the interstate came through was Geeches, which is where Monica just walked. And she's going to yell at me later for going over time because it is her turn again. <laughs> Only because Terry... Told me I was going to be late, and I told her I would. Terry, Terry knows you're going to be late. Yeah. Terry knows. Oh, good. Okay. She okay, knows. Good. You can relax. Um, you can relax. Okay. Good. Good. So behind, and uh, we just bumped into John Talon, who I believe is now working for the Deuces Live Main Street District. Um, that's who I was, who was waving at the camera a minute ago. Um, behind me is now Chief's Creole Cafe, which is a wonderful kind of New Orleans style restaurant. Fantastic gumbo. Uh, great bread pudding and oh it's fantastic it's been open for about eight years or so i think um this was originally hardened grocery store which was a really an institution in the community for 50 years it opened in 1942 and while there was a, a couple of groceries in this area this one was really known as being almost kind of a cultural market because of its unusual specialty foods that it would provide so when it first opened it would it would offer possum and raccoon which they would actually keep live in the backyard and kill right before you know, they were butchering for somebody. Um, it had things like hog's head or hog's jowls and chitlins. Um, so things that were historically um, well-loved foods in the African-American community, they kept on their menu for you know 50 years. They closed in the early 90s. 
It was bought um, by the Bray Boy family who have deep roots in this community and have uh, opened up the Creole Cafe and really been doing a lot of work in the community to help revitalize the neighborhood. Why don't we cross? Okay, we've got the green lights. So let's go ahead and cross. We're going to be walking down to meet Terry Lipsy Scott at the Carter, what was called the Carter Woodson Museum. They're now calling it the Woodson African American Museum, which was originally the community center for the Jer Jordan Park housing complex, which was a award-winning housing project started in the early 1940s and then was revitalized in 2002 with a Hope Six grant. This building that we're about to be entering was the community center for the Jordan Park housing complex. I mentioned that in the decade of the 1930s, there was a 60%, 61% jump in the black population. So overcrowding was a, a significant problem. Um, and Elder Jordan is said to have donated the land that the uh, complex was built on. And so it was named in his honor. This person's going to let us go. Thanks so much. And Andrew, grab a shot of that as we enter. Let's see where Terry, oh, I see the door opening. Hi, Terry. So Terry's gonna tell us a little bit about how the museum came into existence, what they do and where it's going. And then we'll be walking down to Jordan Elementary after. Hi, Terry. Let's give you one of these. We're going to talk very loudly. Um, they like to pop out of your ears, so hold it in there, push it in there real good. Sorry we are late. We had a 10-minute delay on our start, so I really was on time. I was. All right, good. So this is Terry Lipsy Scott. She is the executive director of the Woodson African American Museum. Terry, I told them a little bit about that end of 22nd Street, the Manhattan. Manhattan Casino. John talked about some of the businesses that were originally located near where the interstate is now. Um, I talked a little bit about the Jordan Housing Complex and how it came into existence in the early 40s and that this is a community center. Can you tell us any more about the building and how the museum came into existence? Okay, good. We're not getting good audio on Terry, Monica. Okay, talk a little louder, Terry. Maybe switch. Or you could, never get just, on the other side of you. Yeah. You could pass through both headphones. Yeah. Okay, let me give you both. Here. These? <laughs> Technical oh, difficulties. Technical difficulties. Nothing like it. Can you hear me now? Much better, yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm grateful. I'm grateful. This building was once the room of the community center for Jordan Park, Florida's first. African-American public housing complex. It was built in the late 1990s. We had a horrific riot here in St. Petersburg. White officer shot and killed a black kid. And President Clinton then sent his Secretary of Housing here, Henry Cisneros, to make the lay of the land here in St. Petersburg to determine how the federal government could assist. Here, with that, needless to say, we were awarded some housing but it was awarded at six grant, and the residents of Jordan Park decided they wanted to preserve this building as a museum, a place where African American history is preserved, presented, interpreted, and celebrated. So here we find ourselves in what is now a Woodson African American Museum, and with the new name change, we were the Woodson African American Museum, and we're now moving to the Woodson African American Museum of a little easier to say. <laughs> Will you go inside and Absolutely. have me tell us a little bit about what you know? Absolutely. Come right this way. Thank you. Here is the magnificent space of the Woodson African American Museum. It's a space where we preserve, present, interpret, and celebrate African American history, not just locally, but those of African American descent all over the nation. We currently have on display the work of Dr. Dallas Jackson, who's in fact a Pinellas County School Administrator, who's working on a new essay. And he created this body of work during the pandemic. And we are just ecstatic 
to be a space where African-American artists can in fact display and showcase their works of art where there are often no opportunities to do so. Terry, on that same note, you guys did something I think no one else was doing at the beginning of the pandemic or near, uh, during the Black Lives Matter movement. Tell us about that mural. Oh that's my, out oh my. We were so inspired here at the Woodson when the Black Lives Matter mural was in fact um, paved on our state's capital, nation's capital. And with that, it just moved us to a place of determination and saying, we want that here. We'd like that same element and that message to resonate here in the city of St. Petersburg. And as a result, we engaged 16 different artists oh. to in fact install the most beautiful Black Lives Matter mural in the nation. And we're so excited. I mean, it's just a signature and a landmark piece of it work. It is beautiful. That's right, that's community. And uh, they're seeing it in, in, in big screen on the, on the screen right now. It's a great space, but it's not a huge space. What do you do uh, when you have events that are larger than this small space? Well, it was important when I came on board to figure out ways that we can expand our programming. And as a result of being in the class of 2008 Leadership St. Pete, I best proposed class ever. the best class ever. <laughs> I pitched the idea of us exact expanding the use of the museum by creating a legacy garden. But in fact, this became a revenue generator and a space that we can expand our programming. Would you like to take a peek? Yes, let's go take Please. a peek. Please. 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 Ah, be kind to me. Talk while you're walking, you. This is one of the best kept secrets in St. Petersburg. In fact, this is the garden that the Leadership St. Pete Class of 2008 created for the purposes of extending the museum. In this space, we hosted movies after dark, spoken word under the stars, jazz under the oak. It's a revenue generator from the perspective that we host weddings here. Not only weddings, but anniversaries, birthday parties baby showers and the like. And as you can see, it's just an amazing accountable garden, for lack of a better term or use. This space, in fact, resonates with so many of the residents who come back to the area, remembering the time that they spent in what was a park in this space for the residents of Jordan Park. So this was a park for Jordan Park? This was okay. a park for Jordan Park oh, residents. So with that, we have created the space that lends itself to extraordinary opportunities. Uh, it's just beautiful. I, I hope you can capture it fully on camera, just how, and it's so much cooler. Right there than what's out on the <laughs> Most definitely. Um, so a great revenue generator. You can actually just see, uh, when Andrew turns the camera back this way, you can see some of the Jordan Park um, housing behind us, those blue buildings. It's a great space. Are you going to go bigger? Do you want more? Well, Tell us as about the we are plans. looking to create our new office, which will be located on 22nd Street South, affectionately known as the Deuces, we're looking to create 30,000 square feet. And in this facility, we're also looking to create a garden because so many of our patrons, the first question is, what about the garden? Yeah. What about the garden? So it creates an opportunity for us to replicate not only the garden, but the welcoming that of Black Lives Matter along the frontage of the new museum. We are working feverishly to raise the necessary resources so that this can become a reality. There are several African American museums throughout the state of Florida, but there is not one that's been properly constructed for the purpose of being a museum. Okay. They're all retrofitted buildings. So this creates an opportunity for us to bring in some world-class exhibits to our community as a reflection of African-American art, history, and culture. And the, the viewers are getting to see some of the, the rendering off screen right now. It, it's a gorgeous building. Let's walk back towards the front. It's a gorgeous building, Terry. It looks like an expensive building. Uh, where's the money going to come from? We got a $27 million lift, and we are excited to give thought to 
Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful philanthropists here in the city of St. Petersburg, and each and every one of you who recognize the value of making a contribution to the creation of Florida's first African American Museum as how will be that goal. So, to be clear, it's a $27 million goal that you're trying to raise Absolutely. for the museum, and there's no admission fee to the museum right now. Is that correct? Currently. There is no admission fee in this space, as it's important to us that we, in fact, never find ourselves closing the doors on those who created this opportunity, that we have a space that we're currently calling an African-American museum. Those at least sacrifice the most so that we're having this space that we're calling an African-American museum. And it's for a time that we now honor they made and the foundation that's been laid. Yes. Tell me about, let me, let me grab that so I can hear if John's <laughs> talking to me. Tell me about the, what's going to happen with this building. And I believe you recently landmarked this building. Is that correct? It was recently landmarked by the city of St. Petersburg. It has a historic designation. Okay. Thanks to Council Member Deborah Sanders who led that charge. And with that, we're hopeful to be able to maintain the history of this building and of this community. This will soon be the last vestige of the original Jordan Park community. And with that, there are too many extraordinary stories that we don't want to get away from. We want to always honor and recognize those that came before us and who are responsible for so much of the wonderful history that we celebrate here in St. Petersburg. Well, thank you for showing us around. Thank I'm going to take you. them down the street and show them the remaining, the other remain portion of the Jordan Beautiful. Park that will soon be gone and Jordan Elementary. We appreciate your time. We're Sorry we were late. No worries. Life is good. And hopefully there'll be lots of visitors uh, from our tour coming to see you soon. These stores here. Bye, Terry. Can you still hear me, John? I sure can. Okay, good. Um, yeah. We are walking now. So, Terry mentioned that this is the only, this will be the only remaining portion of the Jordan Park housing complex um, soon. And that is because, as she said, the, the complex was renovated in 2002 with a Hope Six grant. They demolished the original buildings, most of them, except these ones just beyond me. We'll, we'll see them as we walk along this fence here. They are some of the original houses from the Jordan Park complex when it was built in the late 30s, early 40s. Unfortunately, they're set to be demolished. There was some effort to try and preserve them, uh, but that seems to have failed. As you can see, everybody's been moved out and they're boarded up. So it really was important to landmark the community center because things that happened in the community center, you know, again, it was another place where social clubs would meet. Um, and probably one of the most important things was the, it was a meeting place, so sort of the launching pad for the sanitation worker strike of 1968. And this is, I think, one of the greatest stories in St. Pete history. It was led by a man named Joe Savage, a, a garbage man who made 67 cents an hour. The garbage, uh, the sanitation workers for the city had been long promised a raise, better working conditions. It wasn't coming to fruition. There were 211 sanitation workers for the city. 210 of them were black. And they decided, led by Joe Savage, to, that they were going to go on strike, which they did for 116 days, starting in May and running throughout, basically throughout the summer. Now, imagine a city of, you know, roughly 200,000 people probably at that time, not having its garbage collected for 116 days pretty effective um the they would march from the community center down to city hall we have some great pictures there they were joined by um martin luther king's brother now this is just two weeks after martin luther king has been killed in memphis during a sanitation worker strike um they were joined by um ralph albernathy kind of one of martin luther king's lead deputies if you will and ultimately, they ended up winning. Now, they didn't get great concessions. I think it was more of a 
a psychic victory, if you will. Uh, but a lot of people I've heard say in the African-American community that that was really the moment that they believed integration was really happening because they, they actually did win some concessions. So really, you can see how important the community center for the Jordan Park Housing Complex was. Monica, I want to just say we're getting some great comments from people who grew up in that center, whose grandparents grew up in that center. Oh, really? The, the comments are, are great, yeah. Oh, well, fantastic. I'm glad they're watching. Um, yeah, I mean, I've seen some fabulous pictures of the activities that took place in there, and um, I'm, I'm personally just so kind of moved by that sanitation worker strike, and you don't feel like it's something that's not talked a lot about in our history, so I'm glad we had an opportunity to put it on camera. We're gonna finish here at Jordan Elementary, which as I said, was again named for or Elder Jordan, who was a big advocate for education for black students. This was built in 1925. Um, it was the second black elementary school. By 1927, it had 1100 students going to school here. We've got a couple of pictures of um, Davis Academy, which was the first black elementary school and the students there. So it's sort of similar activities. Um, Black teachers, black principal, uh, just a very cohesive community. Now, most of us remember that Brown versus Board of Education was 1954, 1955, uh, which called for the desegregation of public schools. <laughs> I have to get this statistic right because I find it so interesting. In St. Petersburg, between 1954, so the Brown decision, and 1963, nine additional black schools were built in the city. So throughout the South, there, you know, there was a phrase in the Brown decision that desegregation would be done with all deliberate speed. And that was intentionally put in there to sort of give cities an out. So they were moving as fast as they could. They were moving with all deliberate speed to desegregate. But here in St. Pete, we built nine more black schools between 1954 and 1963. Not until 1971, is there a vote by the school board to enact busing to really desegregate schools? So as John was talking earlier with desegregation, this is one of the places that closes in 1975 um, after the schools are desegregated. It later was again bought by the city and a couple million dollars put into it. It was the first LEED certified building in the city and now houses the Head Start program. Uh, so there are these elements of the community that we can still see and there's much more to the deuces that we cover in just this short tour we'll do another one but as we close i want to have andrew film behind me and you can see this is sort of the berm for the interstate now you can see what a barrier it is to i mean it's right in front of the school you can't walk across the street to the businesses that would have been on the other side of the interstate so you can see how the interstate would really have such a tremendous um, negative effect on this community uh, as it did through uh, neighborhoods throughout, black neighborhoods throughout the country. Um, I think it's easy to be nostalgic about this wonderful community and, and a wonderful community it was. And it's hard sometimes to wrestle with why it sort of fell apart and Part of that was desegregation, which was obviously for the greater good. So it's this struggle on how to maintain the, the aspects of this wonderful community um, that everyone loved without obviously going back to the terrible conditions that led to its growth in the first place. It's, it's a conundrum, but it's really a special place when you come down here and eat at Cheese Creole Cafe or one of the new places in 22 south um, you can get it really a good feel for this really historic part of our community that i think a lot of people tend to miss so we thank you very much for joining us please do um visit the carter Woods, the woodson african-american museum there are also organizations in town like the deuces live main street doing a lot of work in this area the african-american heritage association is about to release a, a virtual kind of digital tour of the area there's fabulous african-american heritage trail well, actually, Andrew, why don't we finish right here and show these billboards that you can come down and walk and get so much more information than I've given you. Um, I hope to see you again at a, another tour when we maybe do the second part of the deuces. And we thank Terry for showing us the museum. And thank you all for joining us. And we will see you next time. Bye, John. Bye, Bye-bye.